Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Hello and welcome to our Tuesday Night Live Bible Study. I'm glad that you're with us. And tonight I've got some great things to share with you. You know, the last uh, month or so, Every time I've taught a Bible study or one of my Truth and Liberty things, I'm just sharing the things that I'm studying as I'm reading through the Bible, and I'm now in Deuteronomy, and I just got some things, and I was studying this yesterday and thinking that would be good to share at our Tuesday night Bible study. So I think you'll really be blessed. We're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 17. But before we do that, i got Carrie Pickett here with me, and of course, Carrie is a regular here, and she and her husband are vice presidents of the ministry, and boy, what a blessing. They are, and so she's got some things to share with you. We got yeah. meetings coming up starting on Thursday. Yes, so there's some amazing things happening. So welcome to Tuesday Night Live Bible Study. I'm excited that you're joining us. So Andrew's got some great things, but real quick, just for those of you that are new, um, we have the Tuesday Night Live Bible Study again, not just Tuesday, but live every day of the week. So Monday through Friday, so check us out. Monday and Fridays at 10, Tuesday and Thursday, six o'clock at night, and Wednesdays early in the morning at seven o'clock. So it works with your schedule. And when we do that, we always have live questions. And so tonight, go down down to whatever forum that you're watching on and go down to the chat section and then there you can ask questions and we'll get to as many as we can tonight. Whatever we don't get to, not just tonight or any other, we have a Tuesday afternoon Q&A roundup where Greg Moore, Barry Bennett, two of our amazing teachers here at Karis Bible College will uh, share some great powerful answers. So you want to check that out on Andrew Womack Ministries Facebook page. Go to like and you'll be able to catch that. So there is some amazing things happening here at Karis Bible College besides an amazing school year that has started with over 1,200 students that are hungry for God. It is absolutely amazing. We are running like crazy, but it is good crazy and it is exciting to see what God is doing. I haven't got to ask you, how are we accommodating these 1,200 or? We're sticking them in closets and corners and stacking them on top of I each other. I saw them standing at the cafe to get food and stuff today. Is yeah. everybody getting served? Yeah. No, it's we good. We, we did longer breaks, and so that's been good. So people are able to walk and use the bathroom and eat. And so it's been good. And then when they come back, they are hungry for the word. So awesome. it's been good. It's been really good. Awesome. I'm giving them an update. Right. We haven't got to see each other. We're both so busy. We're going in different directions. We need to see each other. This Tuesday night is good for us to catch Exactly. <laughs> so some good things. But um, this week we are having our vision conference, and this is with Pastor Dwayne Sheriff and Andrew Walmack. They just did a Bible study. Was it last week or the week before? On um, Tuesday night Bible study, didn't yeah, you and Pastor Dwayne? Yeah, last week. Yeah, last week. I was at a volleyball game. My daughter was sh winning and smacking the ball. It was awesome. So Pastor Dwayne and Andrew are, it's going to be awesome. Vision conference. So if you are trying to determine what is your vision and how to pursue it and step into it, this is going to be an absolutely powerful conference. Very, very meaty. That's one of the things I enjoy about you and Pastor Dwayne is they just build off of each other besides razzing each other, the whole conference. So it's going to be fabulous. So that is going to be here uh, September 21st through the 23rd. So Thursday night, that Friday and that Saturday morning afternoon. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. So check us out. Also, our Global Ministers Conference. If you are a minister, if you're in full-time ministry, we want to invite you to our Ministers Conference October 2nd through the 6th. This is the 40th anniversary of the Ministers yeah, Conference. Yeah, it's going to be special. It is going to be so fun. And um, we're also doing it globally. So all of our offices around the world, um, we have so many of them, um, ministers from around the world that are joining us by that. So I would encourage you check us out. Go to awmi.net to register and find out more about that. And then the Women's Arise Conference. And so the Women's Arise is going to be on November 2nd through the 4th. Also super excited about that. Myself, um, Audrey Mack and uh, Elizabeth oh, Mirren are going to be it. So if I could be like any two women, it's those two power packed women <laughs> there are amazing. So it is going to be phenomenal. So we want you to check that out. Also, the other thing besides listening to Andrew tonight, something that we do special on Tuesday nights is you can get the Bible study notes. So um, I'm going to encourage you to go to awmi.net slash, I did this last time, slash something. Yes. 
bible.net slash study. So praise the Lord, go there. And you can sign up and get those Bible study notes. When you do that, we put you in a drawing for discover the keys to staying full of God. That's a great This teaching. is really good. Just you as far as, that? you know what? I don't know if you signed it, but whoever gets it will get a signed one. There you go. And so uh, last week we had Don't Limit God, also powerful book. I think that, uh, that always challenges me and changes my life because you can limit God by what's happening around you and God loves you so much. He's got so much for you. So Alice Scott, you won that book and so we're going to get that out to you. So I am excited about tonight's Bible study. I believe that there's so many things you can receive from this ministry. Uh, another one of the things that we have for you is our prayer. So call us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have prayer ministers that want to agree with you in prayer of the different things going in your life. So call. Check us out on EWMI.net about those events and then our prime ministers. Awesome. Amen. All right, tonight I'm going to share with you uh, just things that I was studying here just yesterday or day before. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, and I'm using my phone. The reason for this is because uh, if you don't have my living commentary, it's awesome. But this commentary is on a Bible app, and so you can... Uh, look at just the verses, but all you got to do is push one button mm -hmm. and it will bring up 26,844 footnotes that I've written. And the reason I'm using this tonight is because I've got some references here that I want to go to. And instead of having to fumble through the Bible and find them, you just stick your finger on it and it brings them right up. It's really a great way to study the Word. Amen. So anyway, from Deuteronomy chapter 17, let me just start here. And it says, and let me preface this by saying that this is Moses talking to the children of Israel right before he went up into the mountain and died. This is his last instruction. And he's basically just recounting the entire Jewish history since the time they came out of the land of Egypt. This is after 40 years in the wilderness and they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And he's reminding them and telling them what to do. And uh, so in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14, it says, And when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. And then he goes on and gives them instructions for how to select a king. But let me just show you this. Years with judges, and then they had... Uh, uh, Saul selected. And so it was around 400 years after this instance that the Lord is saying here through uh, Moses and when they selected the king. And here's what happened when Samuel heard that the people wanted a king. First Samuel chapter 8 verse 5 it says, uh, the Lord told Samuel to say unto them, Behold thou art old, and I, or excuse me, this is the people that said unto Samuel, said, Behold, thou art old, and thy son, sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So that shows you what God's attitude about selecting a king was. This was never his will. And did you know that for 400 years, the Israelites lived under judges? They had the law which taught people individually how to deal with things. And then if something really happened, they could go to the priest. And if the priest couldn't deal with it, they'd bring it to this judge like Samuel or, uh, you know, Samson or Gideon. They were all judges of Israel. And that was what God intended. And he told them that they were not supposed to have a king. And yet here he is knowing that they were going to reject him. And yet he was telling them how to select the king. That was never his will. You know, this just really impacted me, Carrie, to think that God doesn't want us to do certain things, but he knows our flesh and he knows that we're going to mess up. Wow. And he loves us anyway and even tells us how to deal with things outside of his will. If I was God and it's like, if you don't do it my way, it's my way or the highway. I'd just turn you into a pile of ashes. <laughs> this amazed me that, you know, another thing that you can compare to this is that in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and other places, the Lord gave Moses instructions on if a person, uh, their marriage didn't work, how you could divorce and how you could remarry. And he gave this. And so in the New Testament, 
the uh, scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, you know, what is God's will? And he said, from the beginning, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And then they came back. Well, then why did Moses allow divorce? And Jesus said, it was never God's will. He did this because of the hardness of your heart. And yet he allowed David to have 13 wives. Solomon had 1,000 wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines. That was never God's will. And yet God dealt with people even when they violated things. You can see grace here if you're looking for it. You can see the grace of God. So here he is telling them, I don't want you to have a king, but I know you are going to want one. And when you get one, here's what he's telling them in verse 15. Thou shalt uh, in any wise... Uh, set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. You know, this is scriptural precedent for not having like a president in the United States who is a foreign-born person. You had to you had to be born here with the exception in the very beginning, very few of our colonists were born here. Mm -hmm. Some of them came over, but when the Constitution was put into effect, you had to be born in the United States. And that comes straight from Scripture. And then look at some of the instructions that he gave to this king that never was his perfect will. And yet he's telling them, this king, how he's supposed to function. In verse 16 it says, But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord has said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. In other words, there's a number of things to get out of this passage, and that is that when you get born again and God changes your life, there needs to be a clear break between your previous life and your current life. Lots of times in Scripture, the people would actually change their name. And like, for instance, Saul became Paul, and you had Peter, that be, or excuse me, it was Simon that became Peter. Jesus changed his name. Upon this rock, I'll build the church. And so you saw a lot of people change their name because actually there should be that dramatic of a change in your life. You ought to go from being a person who is living for yourself and doing your own thing to now you're a brand new person and sometimes it was facilitated by a name change. And so that's part of it. But also he specifically said not to multiply to himself horses. And let me just share some verses with you about that. In 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26, it says, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses and his chariots 12,000 horsemen. If you go over to 1 Kings chapter 10, in verse 26, And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots and with the king at Jerusalem. And, and the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yard, and the king's merchants received the linen yard at a price. And so these two scriptures also, 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 25, says the same thing. The Lord specifically told when they got a king not to multiply horses to themselves. And did you know if you really remember this scripture, it says that when uh, David was king and he finally made Solomon his son and uh, Abimelech had tried to take over the kingdom mm -hmm. and he had proclaimed himself as king, the way that David countered that, he put Solomon upon his mule and made him ride through the streets. And I've always wondered why a mule? Man, to me, a mule and a horse are two totally different animals. <laughs> but why did David only have a mule? Because of this verse, that a king was not supposed to multiply to himself horses. Of course, at that time, horses, all of the Arabians were the ones that horses came from, and they all came out of Egypt. And you had to go back to Egypt. That's where you got your horses from. They weren't prominent in other places. So in order to have these horses, and it even says that about Solomon, he had to go back to Egypt and do business with these people, and God wanted a clean break. So mm -hmm. Solomon violated what the Word of God told him to do, and that was part of hardening his heart and causing him to fall away from the Lord. In the next verse, here's another command to the king. It says in verse 17, Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, 
And here's the reason, that his heart turned not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Let me read this to you out of 1 Kings chapter 11. It says, but King Solomon loved many strange women. This isn't talking about that they were just strange. It's talking about many women that weren't Israelites. And the Lord gave a specific command not to marry any of the people who came out of those nations because if you made uh, marriages with them, then that woman would be, uh, you know, sensitive to her family, to her relatives and stuff, and it would cause them not to go in and wipe them out the way that God had instructed. They were not supposed to have relations. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a racial thing as much as it was a purity thing about keeping the, their hearts pure. And you can prove that because the Lord allowed them to marry people that were outside of the promised land. Moses himself married a woman that was a Cushite from uh, down in southern part of uh, Egypt and stuff like that. God wasn't against racial marriages. It was against marrying into another faith and these people that were destined to be mm -hmm. destroyed. He didn't mm -hmm. want them having an affinity for those people. So it says, King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, which again, God said you were to have no contact with Pharaoh, with Egypt. And yet he did this as a political thing to make peace with the Egyptians. It says, woman of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zonians, and Hittites of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, talking about marriage, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Yeah. Solomon clave unto these in love. Again, see, that shows you the reason for it. It's not a racial thing. It was about them and their gods and their idolatry. Yeah. And it says in verse 3, And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. This is exactly what God told him not to do. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father." Mm -hmm. Then did Solomon build a high place. That's talking about a, an idol, an altar for Chemos, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives which burn incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Wow. So the Lord specifically said, you aren't supposed to have a king but I know you're going to rebel at me. So if you do, when you do get a king, here's what you need to do with him. And it says, do not allow him to multiply horses. Do not let him go back to Egypt and do business with those people. There needs to be a clean break. Solomon violated that, first of all. And then he started marrying all of these strange women and it wound up turning his heart away from God. This is a man who twice God appeared unto him and said, I'll give you anything you want. And he chose wisdom over all of these things. His heart was right, and God used him. He's the one that built the temple, yeah. and he had miraculous things. When they dedicated the temple, there was actually a visible and a, a fire that came down and lit the sacrifice. They didn't put fire to it. God sent fire from heaven, and he saw all of these miraculous things, and yet he turned away from God. Why? Because he did not follow the instructions that God gave him. Man, this is so practical. Look in verse 18, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, he shall, not, he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. In verse 19, And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. What is the fear of the Lord? There's a lot of things you can say about this, but Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13 says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and yeah. to hate all of these other things that God hates. And it says that you can learn the fear of the Lord by reading the Word every day. It says he had to keep this copy of the Word with him and read it every day. And there are people, again, you're watching this Bible study, so you're already above average most people <laughs> 
do not even give this much preference to the Word. But you need to do this every day. And you don't need to just wait on me to digest the Word and feed it to you. You need to go directly to the Word. And it says here that if you will read the Word every day is what it says. He would learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes. And then it goes on to say that being in the Word every day, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just so simple. You have to have somebody to help you to misunderstand it. And yet it's like we've had a lot of help. And there's very few people who really go to the effort of every single day being in the Word. You know, I taught four hours in school today. I assume you did Yep. did four. <laughs> so both of us taught four hours in school today. And then I did a hour long Zoom with all of our alumni and I taught them. And so that's five hours worth of teaching that I've done today. Mm -hmm. And I did go out to eat with Jamie, which was about an hour and a half. And here we are teaching again. So this is going to be close to six hours worth of teaching I'll do today. And yet I have spent time in the Word today yeah. and studying the Word. And yeah. I do it every single day. Mm -hmm. There might be some days I miss, like yesterday I drove 11 hours. And I, well, I did. I spent an hour and a half or two hours in the Word mm -hmm. before I went to bed last night. But normally uh, there are some days I may not spend in the Word. But this is just, these are commands. And the Lord said, this will happen if you don't do it. If the king begins to multiply horses, if he goes back to Egypt and has contact with them, did you know having contact with people and doing merchandise with people who are non-believers in itself isn't wrong, but man, Egypt was the dominant force of that day and God said, you make a clear break. They didn't do it. Mm -hmm. He says, don't get all these horses and they did it. And then don't multiply to yourselves wives and they did it anyway. And here's step after step after step. And Solomon, a man who was so close to God at one time, wound up actually turning to be an idolater. Did you know Solomon is the one that wrote the book of Proverbs? He's the one that wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And this man who wrote scripture and that was the wisest man that ever lived and blessed by God so that there will never be another person as rich and as wealthy as Solomon. You know, if you read it in Kings, you may not get that. But if you read in the first chapter of the book of First Chronicles, it says that there would never be anyone after him as rich. He was blessed by God as possibly no other man in history ever has. And yet because he didn't keep the word, because he didn't read it every day, the way that the scripture says, he turned away from God. Wow. Boy, there is a lesson in this for us. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 11 says that, you know, all of these things were our examples so that we could learn through them not to lust, not to murmur, not to complain, not to commit idolatry, and on and on. And I tell you, if you aren't reading these scriptures and if you don't see the warning that's here and if you don't take heed to it, who do you think you are that Solomon, one of the men that has been graced by God more than anybody else turned away from God and actually became an idolater. He was used by God to write scripture and yet he wound up being an idolater. If that happened to Solomon, who do you think you are? Why in the world do we think that we can get by without constantly being in the word of God? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, this really, really impacted me. And of course, this is something I've believed for a long time and I try and operate in it every day, but it encouraged me to be more diligent to make sure that I put priority on this. Yeah. Uh, Carrie and I were talking about this, that you know, she and her husband have so much weight of the ministry on them. I asked what she was doing last weekend <laughs> and you were writing books and... Studying and working on lessons. And, and <laughs> you know what, that's good, but good things can destroy yeah. your relationship with God. If all yeah. you're doing is going to the Word to get something for somebody else yeah. and not getting it for yourself, yeah. you'll eventually fall uh, yeah. from what relationship with God. So yeah. this is something that Carrie and I were talking about, that we need to constantly just be seeking the Lord and making yes. ourselves sensitive 
to the Lord. And I want to encourage you with these things tonight, that this is what God has for each one of you. Amen. And you need to take a lesson from this. Learn at Solomon's expense. Learn Amen. at David's expense. Yeah. This is exactly what those scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 are saying, that all of these things were given for our example so that we could learn through them. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the blessings that I've had, and Carrie also has done this because she grew up in Lawson Purdue's church and she's loved mm -hmm. the Lord since she was a little girl. Yeah. But because we've been seeking the Lord, we haven't gone out and committed adultery. We haven't mm -hmm. wound up crashing and burning. And it's because we learn through these yeah. examples. Mm -hmm. And there are so many of you, Amen. I'm saying this in love, but you aren't letting the Word of God constantly affect you and you aren't learning the fear of the Lord, which is to hate evil. Yeah. And because of it, you're vulnerable. It's like you don't have your armor on. You don't have your shield up yeah. because you aren't focused on these things. And I tell you, the, the Word of God is the most important thing in your life outside of your salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Word of God is the most important thing in your spiritual life. And I'm just appalled at how many people don't really spend time in the Word of God. Amen. This yeah. is one of the things we stress in our Bible college. And I make our first year students yep. read through the Bible in nine months. Yeah. And every year somebody complains about it. And I say, why in the world would you complain about having to read the Bible, the Bible. if you come to a Bible school? It ought to be mandatory. It is. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You know, um, we were, I was teaching in school today and reading out of Psalms 119, verse 37, it says, Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things. Revive me in Amen. your way. Amen. And I think that the, the, the thing about the Word of God, it, it truly shows you what's worthless. And what the world says is of value, it, it shows you where, where you find your source, where you find your strength, it, it revives you. And I think there's so many people that are discouraged, they're frustrated, they're looking around at everything, they're consuming everything around them, and then they wonder why they're not seeing the life of God. But this actually, this teaches you to turn your eyes because you start to see what's of real value. There's all kinds of things that the world says you need to have, but it's of no value. It's actually right. categorized at as worthless things. That Psalms 119 has 168 verses in I it. I love it. Every verse mm -hmm. is talking about the law, commandments, yep. precepts, com uh, under, you know, every word, every verse is something about the Word of God, 168 verses. It's one of, it's one of my favorite chapters. I've been teaching out of it quite a bit. I love it in verse 18 of 190 says, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. So many times people have an attitude that it's going to be boring. You don't understand it. And that's when you just invite the Holy Spirit, Lord, open my eyes that I can see wondrous things, the answers, the treasure, the value. And so you begin, and I, and I say this all the time, you cannot have relationship with God outside of a relationship with the word of God. We wouldn't know how to spell Jesus if it wasn't for the Word. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Psalms 119, I believe it's verse 100, if I can get over there to it quickly. Have you already got it? Yes. What I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Man, the God has spoken <laughs> that to me because, you know, I'm a college <laughs> dropout and I really have struggled about uh, you know, how do I accurately represent the Lord? And that's just a promise that if we get into the Word of God, God's Word will make you understand more than the ancients. And yeah. I think it's the verse in front of that that's basically saying. Uh, I like the two in front of it. It says, for you through your commandments make me wiser yeah. than my enemies. And that's awesome. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditation. Man, that's, and that's true in my life. You know, mm -hmm. I have, I'm not saying this in a prideful way, but I'm saying it in a thankful way that God has prospered us. We have finances coming in. We're reaching people. Yeah. We have one of the largest reaches, television ministries in the world. And it is not because of my great wisdom. It's because <laughs> I meditate in the Word and God spoke things to Amen. me and I followed it and it works. Amen. So this is what I wanted to get across tonight is that the same way that God warned the Israelites, this is what's going to happen if you violate my commandments. And it happened. And sure enough, uh, man, all of these things came to pass. I'm warning you that if you don't get in the Word day and night, then you aren't going to learn to fear God. You, aren't, you are going to make mistakes. 
we are not sharp enough to run our own life. God has given us that choice and you have the freedom to choose. He's not going to force His will upon you, but the right choice is to run up a white flag and say, Oh, God, help me. I don't want to lean under my own understanding. I want you to direct me. So yeah, hopefully this so will encourage you to get into the Word of God and let God direct you. Amen. Well, we have some really good questions. So uh, I, want to, I want to get through as many as possible. It says, um, Quabo Victor on YouTube says, The Bible says we must preach the Word of God and be an example in the world. How do you respond when you fall into sin? So how do you respond? How do you exemplify to the well, world? Well, the Word of God is still the Word of God, even if you aren't living it. And so I would still speak the Word of God even if I was in sin and wasn't living it. But you are going to lose a huge amount of confidence in yourself. The people who are listening to you are going to call you a hypocrite. And I tell you, the world hates hypocrisy. Yeah. Uh, even the ungodly hate a hypocrite. And so you're going to, you're going to weaken your stance anytime you do that. So uh, if you have sinned, repent. And, you know, I just heard Max Lucado last week. I was reading something by him, and he was called America's pastor. He was so popular that they had tour buses coming to his church. I mean, even during the week to see him. And he was, he was so popular, but there was so much pressure on him that he started turning to beer to deal with the pressure. And he wound up, I don't know if he was an alcoholic, but he said he was, he was drinking to excess, mm -hmm. and it was hurting him. And he's admitted it. And so now he's humbled himself. This was him saying it. So I'm not saying anything about him that he didn't say about himself. Mm. But he humbled himself, confessed it to his church. His elders dealt with it. Now he's on top of the situation. And now the tour buses don't come. He's not America's pastor anymore. Mm -hmm. But he's admitting that he just couldn't handle the stress. And he uh, went ahead and got ahead of where he was, uh, you know, mature enough to handle it. And so my point is that, see, here's a man who's very visible, and yet when he humbled himself, man, God forgave him, and people will forgive you too. Now, your enemies may not. They may bring those things up, and you probably be dealing with the sin that you've had the rest of your life. But if you will expose it, I tell you, it's like a fungus. If mm -hmm. you keep a fungus hidden, it'll continue to grow. But when you expose it to the light, when you humble yourself and admit your sin, and first of all, go to God and get confidence that God has forgiven you, then go back to preaching the truth. And there's people that will bring up your past and criticize you, but if you've truly humbled yourself and God has forgiven you, you can actually use whatever failure you've got as a testimony to other people and encourage them how to find forgiveness and cleansing through it. Though. Amen. That's, that goes along with a question that Autumn asked here. Um, David was a murderer, an adulterer. He had many wives and concubines. And he did other things. So how did he become the one after God's own heart? Well, I think he was the man after God's own heart. That's from um, 1 Samuel 13, 14, if I'm not mistaken. That's when he became the man after God's own heart. And did you know that? that was eight years before he was born. God called him a man after his own heart. And, but he was a man after God's own heart. And when he sinned with Bathsheba and then committed murder on Bathsheba's husband, that wasn't after God's own heart. He fell, but he came back. And one of the things I think that made him truly a man after God's own heart was not these acts of sin, but when he was confronted with his sin, in Psalms chapter 51, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. And he didn't pass the buck like Adam saying, it's that woman that you <laughs> gave me. No, he accepted it. He says, yeah. against you and you only have I sinned. And I think that is a quality after God's own heart is when you do mess up, you don't sit there and try and excuse yourself. You just repent. And so his adultery and murder wasn't being after God's own heart, but the way he was before, the way he humbled himself, the way he refused to yeah. uh, use his own flesh to gain the kingdom, he waited on God to promote him. And then when his sin was exposed, the way he humbled himself and repented of it, that was, those were definitely God qualities, and very few people will humble themselves like that. Yeah, 
That's good. So uh, Jane on chat asks this, should we continually read straight through the Bible? I often feel like there's not enough time. Is the New Testament more important to read if we're short on time? Should we study a certain book for a given amount of time? I get overwhelmed wanting to understand all of it, and I often feel I'm not really understanding a lot. Man, you should have been in my class today. I <laughs> taught on that exact thing, and I taught that there's four types of Bible study, systematic Bible study, topical Bible study, word a Bible study, and then meditation. And I had taught 15 heard, minutes before heard, you on meditation. Yeah, they said that. <laughs> yeah. And, and anyway, <laughs> I was teaching that probably the most powerful are the topical study, word study, and meditation. Yeah. But if you don't systematically study, you'll wind up studying your pet doctrines. It's like a person lifting weights with one arm. You could get to where you could pump 100 or 200 pounds right here and yet your legs atrophy because you don't exercise them. You yep. need all of your body tone. That's good. And you need the systematic Bible study. So I happen to have a teaching entitled How to Study the Bible. That's and good. you can call our number at 719 uh, 635-1111 and you can ask and they'll direct you to that. But you need to study systematically. You need to do all of these things simultaneously. If you aren't careful, you'll study your pet scriptures and you'll get strong in one area and deficient in another. Yeah, that's kind of what Candace asks here on YouTube. She says, good evening. If you are facing emotional issues such as anxiety, should we just meditate on all the books of the Bible or just specific ones? Again, I'm saying you ought to study all of it, but if you, like for instance, if you're fighting healing, uh, sickness, and you need a healing, yeah. you may have to focus on healing or you aren't going to be around to study all of these <laughs> other scriptures. So the situation may dictate that you, if you're really struggling emotionally, you might have to study on things like I've got yeah. a teaching on how to harness your emotions and things like that. And you may have to focus on just those scriptures. But if you get so delivered that all you do the rest of your life is study on emotions, then you won't ha you won't be strong in the area of finances. You won't understand about healing, yeah. and you'll be deficient. And so you can do anything for a short period of time, but you shouldn't just focus on one area only. Yeah. And that's what the vast majority of the body of Christ does. Yeah, people get into faith. They'll get into grace. They'll get into healing. They'll get into finances. They'll get into end times or something like that, you need to study the whole thing, even the baguettes. Yeah. <laughs> so Clayt on chat asks this, is it difficult to effectively understand the Bible if we study it on our own without attending a Bible college? I'd say that it's easier if you take, like for instance, in our school, we have yeah. over a thousand years of combined Bible study and walking with the Lord. And we're sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly with you. Mm -hmm. And you can learn by our experiences. So I think it could help you. It certainly is a good thing. But I didn't go to Bible college. Yeah. I learned it through the School of Hard Knocks. Mm -hmm. And you know, it took me a long time. It was 32 years after the Lord touched my life and called me to ministry when I started on television and the Lord told me, you're just now starting, mm. which that meant that for 32 years, he was just preparing me. I believe it doesn't have to take 32 years. I probably could have learned better if I'd have gone through somebody, but you can learn by yourself. If you survive the school of hard knocks, it makes a great testimony. <laughs> On the other hand, from someone who went to Bible school, who learned from someone who went through the hard knocks, it's also a blessing. If your heart is hungry, you know, we've been all over the world and there's people who are hungry for God and they don't have teachers mm -hmm. and they don't have ministers. And the, you have the Holy Spirit. He's called the teacher. He said, who's going to lead you and guide you into all truth and understanding. So if, you going, if you're going to the Word and you're asking the Holy Spirit to teach you, He'll teach you. Sometimes, though, when you have questions, you can ask. And I think that's one of the things that we have I found. I never had anybody to ask questions, but I did go to other people's meetings. Mm -hmm. And they Learned impacted me greatly. And I remember that, man, they'd just say one thing, and it would keep me busy for a year yeah. trying to figure out all of the stuff. So it's not like I wasn't 
impacted by other people, but yeah. I didn't have a person that I could go to and talk to. And that's one of the things why even within Keras, what we've been doing is we'll, we'll talk about foundations. This is, these are foundations of the gospel. This is what he's given. So this is who he is, who he is within you, who you are in him. This is how you view the devil. So there is a process when you start to get a hold of something, you're like, oh, if that means this and oh, that means that. And that can be really exciting. And so, but what's awesome is they're so, we're so blessed. If you're watching this, you are so blessed because there's so much free, godly teaching material out there in the world. Andrew Womack Ministries, awmi.net, has so much free material. I think there, you don't have to sit back and go like, well, I can't know God because I can't go to Bible school. That's just an excuse. We got 200,000 hours of free material mm, on yeah. our website. So, And then we got other stuff that we ask for a, a price, but 200,000 hours of free. If you listen every day, for 24 hours a day, it'd take 22 years to go through it. And if you only listen eight hours a day, it'd take 66 years to go through all Amen. of our free stuff. That ought to keep you busy for a <laughs> That while. should keep you busy. So the word, there's a plethora of the word. Mm -hmm. So um, a question here is, you said there needs to be a break from previous life. And you were talking about the Israelites. So um, the question is, how drastic should this look? Bad marriage, jobs, relationships, how, how big, how drastic, what's some guidance on break from previous life? Well, it'd be hard for me to give a specific without knowing your situation, but I don't think that like, say for instance, if you were married outside of the Lord and if your husband or wife is an unbeliever, I don't think that this is saying that you ought to divorce them. Uh, man, you've committed yourself to that and you need to hold to it, but that doesn't also mean that you can make that marriage be what it's supposed to. It takes two people to make a marriage work. So again, you'd have to just let the Lord lead you in that. As far as other relationships, the way I look at it is like Paul, he went into the synagogues and taught these people for three months. And as long as they gave him freedom to be the one in charge in doing the teaching, he went into a place that did not accept Jesus as Messiah. But when they openly spoke against it, this is Acts chapter 19, then he separated the people who had received and put them in a school and taught them for three years. So as long as you are in control, I think you can go back to your old friends. You could go back, I don't, you could go into a bar if they'll let you stand up and preach and teach mm -hmm. everybody, but don't go in there and sit and receive that atmosphere and let them be the ones influencing you. Yeah. If you can have your friends and you're the one who's the influencer, and you're dominating, and they're receptive and they're wanting to know, you can keep that. But man, if those people turn against you, I would still, you know, reach out and tell them, God loves you, I love you, and I'm here for you. But if they're rejecting and, and fighting against what you're saying, you need to withdraw from that. Yeah. And scripture goes along with that, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, come out from among them and be ye separate, touch, and saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So yeah. there's scriptural precedence for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Mm -hmm. And if you just continue in your old lifestyle and, and think you're gonna somehow or another change them, you put a rotten apple in a basket of good apples and the good apples don't make the rotten apple better. The rotten apple will make the good apples uh, corrupt. Yeah, and it's good. just the way that it works in a fallen world. Yeah. So if they're receptive and if you are influencing them, then you can continue. But if they are influencing you and you just think that by you being silent and somehow or another praying for them, you're gonna change them, it's not gonna happen. No. I like what our um, CEO here of the ministry, Billy Epperhart, says that he always used to say to his kids, I use this now with my kids, he said, if you can sit on the, talking about friends, if you can sit on the, the piece of ice and melt it, then you can stay. He said, but if they're starting to freeze you, you lean to leave. That's right. And so it's just that discernment. It, I like what Psalms uh, 1 says. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I remember as a teenager, some, they told me, they said, listen, you start walking with the ungodly, it's eventually, eventually you stop and you stand because it seems normal. And then eventually you sit. Yeah. 
And so there's a progression of ungodliness and sinners and scornful because you, your heart starts to take counsel in that environment and that community. So you've got to be careful who you're walking after. So if you are with. really excited about the Lord and you're just talking about the Lord and constantly sharing, I guarantee you those people are either going to yield and <laughs> respond and become good friends in the Lord yeah. or they will leave you. If you can go into an ungodly situation and blend in, you aren't standing yeah. up for the Lord. Yeah, that's good. So a uh, question here. Um, um, how can I meditate on the Word of God without any distractions? Well, first of all, it's a process to get your mind into that. It's not just something you can do. If your mind has been used to being scattered and occupied, you're in a sense addicted yeah. to those things and you've got to withdraw yourself and it's a process and you start and yeah. at first you'll find your mind wandering back to the old things and you just keep bringing it back yeah. and every time you do it, it gets a little bit mm -hmm. easier and easier and you can eventually reach a place where you keep your mind stayed on the Lord, Isaiah 26, 3 and first, uh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 5 says you can got weapons that can bring every thought into captivity and under obedience to Christ. So you can do it, it's a process and you just have to start the process. Yeah. We're out of time. We're out of time. So there are more questions, really great questions. So please check us out on Tuesday afternoons where we do a roundup of extra, extra times and then watch more of our Bible studies. Ask these questions. I think that's one of the, the dynamics that's so powerful about our Tuesday Night Live Bible studies that you can ask questions and that's one of the ways that you can grow. Yeah. If you have a question that you just, man, got to get answered, call our helpline, 719-635-1111. And we have people there 24-7. And these people can pray with you. They can answer your questions. And also they can send you to uh, materials. We've got materials that deal with all of this stuff. Yeah. A teaching that goes along with what I'm teaching is uh, uh, found, uh, Sure Foundation, Effortless Change. How to Study the Bible, you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, How to Study the Bible. I've got a lot of teaching oh my gosh, on this. So the good. Word became flesh. And yeah. so anyway, they can direct you towards all of those things. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Again, check out our other live Bible studies. And again, Tuesday night. And again, go to awmi.net slash events and check out the Vision Conference, our Global Ministers Conference, and then Women's Rise. We would love to have you out here. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. God bless you. It's not enough to know what God's will is, but you have to learn how to do things God's way. Now, because of the new man on the inside of me, because of the cross, I can daily deny self. And if you don't learn to do that, you're not going to fulfill all God's will for your life. You know, you don't find the beginning of God until you get to the end of yourself. This generation is a generation of great darkness and God is raising up a deliverer to shine in the midst of all of this darkness. But in Christ Jesus, I can do all things through Christ. Some people just quote, I can do all things. No, you can't. But through Christ, you can do all things. You gotta have these two opposites in balance. I'm nothing, but I'm everything in Christ. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.